Hey, what's up? How much? I'm just going to full screen your video, Tim, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, go for it. Here. Here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm fucking talking about. Yeah, look at this guy. Yeah, yeah baby. Wait, hang on. My cat, but she's she's sitting right right in here. There she is, right back there. I don't know if you can see her because it's so bright. Like your cat could probably eat this dog. This dog's like 4.2 pounds. Ella's very aggressive also. She hates all other creatures. There was a cat that was in our backyard and she would swat at it through the window. She fucking hated that cat. This this little dog is really aggressive, but his bark is hilarious. It's just like and it's like really, really low. It sounds like a uh, it sounds like a person pretending to be a dog. Uh that's so great. At like a, a low volume. It's it's very funny. I love that. This is my dog's uh, we're calling him my dog's cousin. This is a Sir Punchkin Kickwell. Much smaller than Bibbity Babbis, uh, in like a hilarious way. Wow, and Bibbity is already so tiny. Yeah, I know. So that makes this all the more surreal that I have this dog that can fit in my coat pocket. He can literally fit in my coat pocket. Why the not? inside pocket of my coat. Listen. It's very, very funny when he's in there. Here's his wife. Oh, there it is. She's the nicest dog I've ever met. Oh. She's the calmest, quietest dog. Goody Kickwell. She just she just lays lays like If this. you told me that you put down one dog and picked the same <laughs> dog back up, I would not have uh Oh that's an interesting observation. Two dogs, two dogs. Two dogs. Oh, okay. Now I can see the difference in size. Double dog in it. They're so small. They're 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 tiny, but she's uh she's almost twice as big as him, which is very funny. That yeah. is very funny. They both look like little teddy bears. She's a little wife and he's tiny husband is what I call them. <laughs> Perfect. Brandish to the planet buster. I don't even know her. This is episode 262 of Insert Credit, the only video game podcast with correct opinions and a horrible buzzer. I'm Alex Jaffe, and if I were a playable character in a racing game, then my vehicle would be a big worm wearing a top hat. (laughs) That's so good. Uh, I'm Frank Cifaldi. If I were a character in a racing game, my car, it'd be like a really tiny... uh, train like the, like whatever the front part of a train is called what is that called uh the engine the the, the engine it's just called an engine the first yeah. the first car on a train yeah i'd be a train engine with like like imagine a mcdonald's toy with like a character popping out of the top kind of thing you know it'd be uh-huh. a really tiny engine with me just kind of out of the top smiling uh, i'm tim rogers and if i were a playable character in a racing game you know we'd all like to think that we would be one of the uh, particularly muscular comic booky uh, the heroes from f-zero gx sure though here's what i would be i would be uh just me wearing a captain falcon uh, uh on a perfectly authentic captain falcon costume that just hilariously didn't fit uh, uh because it would just it would fit the worst way possible uh, none of the seams would match up to the appropriate bones. Uh, none of the musculature would be present. Uh, I would I would want to be driving Samurai Goro's Fire Stingray, <laughs> except okay. I would instead be driving Sweet Tooth's um, ice cream truck from <laughs> from, uh, from Twisted Metal. That's the honest answer. Pretty uh, good. Thank you. Thank yeah, that you. Makes sense. I'm Brandon Sheffield. If I were to be driving one of them little car cars, I would probably be driving. Um, like a human skeleton that's shaped into a car. Uh, it's like a big human skeleton that's it's just like weirdly larger than a than a than a regular human. Oh, Home Depot skeleton. Home Depot skeleton, forty foot skeleton. I'd be uh, HDS. I'd be wearing a little cape and uh, and I'd make nefarious comments. Um, so that's that's that would be me. Would you have a little mustache? Yeah, a little snidely whiplash guy. Mm-hmm, like that'd be a little whiplashy. You just gotta say the name. I was gonna just gradually <laughs> reveal uh, uh, your costume details. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little, little pencil mustache. We have an agenda here, Tim. We have to keep yeah. moving along. We don't have time for this. Joining us this week, it's a good friend of the show, and the Italian Elon Musk, Gita Jackson, is here. <laughs> I can't change my display name on Twitter. I can't do it. It won't let me. And I want to change it now because... Uh, I don't like it when people tweet at me assuming I am Elon. People still DM me assuming I am Elon Musk and that I can help them with their financial woes. That's the target demographic of uh, Twitter right there. I don't want to hear about that. 
I want to hear what your car would be if you were a racing car. I was thinking about this the whole time. It would be my cat, Ella, but rideable, <laughs> a rideable size. And I then love it. I would be wearing like a little kitty cat uh, Kigurumi, and I would use all the voice lines that Cat Peach in Mario Kart uses. Like when she loses and she says, meow, meow, next time. That, I, that's how I would be. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds That's right. very good. I, I need to reiterate that my sweet tooth would be painted entirely matte black, just to let everybody know. Oh, wow. That's just more solid color. You're giving me a run for my money now uh, with yeah. my snide lady. I just, I, I, I really meant to point that out uh, uh, while I was I, I just, you know, going back and uh, just uh, adding that detail to let everyone know. Letting everyone know you only sell chocolate ice cream. <laughs> yeah, well, That's right. I mean, sort of. Charcoal ice cream. That's the one. Activated charcoal, yeah. yeah. That's the good stuff right yeah, now. Yeah, if you want all of your medications to stop working, just horf that down. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I want that. That's the dream. Uh, do you think there's anybody who abbreviates activated charcoal as ac Absolutely. Uh, yes. I definitely there's think gotta that. Be, there's got to be some nutritionist for them. Like some freakish wellness like cult out there is like, I got to get my, my ac chark on today. Mm-hmm. I, I love it. I enough ac chark today. It's so good. Well, as we all know, Every episode of this podcast has a winner that I assign at the end of the episode based on how well they did. Uh, last week's winner was Andres Velasco y Cole, who wrote in to ask us this question for winning last week's episode. With Elon Musk showing us that he can speedrun ruin a company like Twitter at a world record pace, mm-hmm. has there been a speedrun or tool-assisted speedrun that you have watched that has stuck with you for how utterly absurd it is? Hmm. I don't know why Elon Musk had to be in that question. I don't know either. I was thinking so that weird. it would be like, imagine you were uh, the CEO of a video game company yeah, and you had you to, like ruin to ruin it ruin? as quickly as possible. I like or- that question a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> Has there been a speed run that uh, I, that sticks with me? I mean, I don't know, actually. Let's do that other question because we've actually answered this speed run question before. Have we? Okay. Here it is, though. Here yeah. it is, though. It's got to be Sony Computer Entertainment. How would you ruin Sony, the makers of PlayStation, if you had to ruin them right now? How would you do it? Make the PS5 even more expensive. Yeah, I would. I would. Uh, here's mm. here's what I would do. I would. I would. I would make a new peripheral. It's based on an old peripheral, but it's not compatible with the old stuff. I would make it cost way more than the last one did, and I would not get any uh, developer support. That's what I would do. So not I would make the based PS- on anything that happened. I would make the PSVR two. And uh, and that's that's what I would do. No, I mean, I, I wonder what can ruin Sony because they have a great track record of putting out uh, like a platform that seems cool, like the Vita, and then messing it up <laughs> and just being yeah. like, mm, we don't like it anymore. They like they like to own formats is one of their things. They like to have a format that they own. Mm-hmm. It was remarkable, even long past the Vita's you know, sell-by date, basically. In Chicago, If you, I, I lived in Hyde Park, Chicago for a little while right after college. And I love that zone. It's a good zone. It's beautiful down there. And some, one of the only parts of the city was beautiful, immaculate pre-war buildings, which is you know, pre-fire buildings even, which is just so gorgeous. And then the lakefront there. Anyway, but every time you got in a bus, there would be at least one black teenager playing like any just any video game on the Vita because it's hacked front to front and back basically and that would consistently happen just any time I was in a majority black neighborhood in Chicago and then all over the country and I just don't understand we're now long par- past that time of the video game uh sort of logistics where people were like and the black market is just not interested in any of the stuff at all right but it's so wild that sony refused refused to believe that the black people loved the via the ps vita <laughs> as much as they did people they loved the ps vita they're still playing the vita essentially did you see that photo where someone was at the kendrick lamar concert uh, recording footage on a vita no but i believe that that was seven days ago <laughs> Oh, that rules. <laughs> I'm telling you, people, black people love the Vita. It does ex- everything you want them to do. They want to do. They want to play fucking Battlefield or whatever and record their concerts and listen to all their music. And they want it to be one device. It's basically a little PlayStation. And they had it. Sony had it. And then we're like, mm, but we don't like this anymore. Yep. They even had it doing remote play from the PlayStation, like Ridiculous. over a network and everything. And it's like. And they had the Vita TV. They put out the Vita TV and they're like, okay, cool. We, we got this thing, plays all the Vita games, really good, really tiny. But what we're not going to do is get the Netflix license or any of that kind of stuff. So it can't like play, can't be also a streaming device. It's like, 
Why? <laughs> Why didn't you just... So just, weird. It's so obvious that that's what it's for. Video games for a lot of these companies are, as we know, like a, a, a tertiary revenue stream for a lot of the time, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, but I feel like when other companies screw up, it's much easier to explain how and why, but when Sony makes really unfathomable business decisions, I, it takes like an entire essay for me to explain why even like how we got there, you know? Yeah. Their, their way that they mismanage their own company is much more difficult to explain because even, even with the PS5 not doing exceptionally well, uh, PlayStation and Sony, they've just been acting like everything's fine. Everything's 100% fine. And it's harder to explain that even though God of War is out and everyone's playing God of War, that Sony's not exactly doing well in terms of video games. But I guess they don't have to worry about anything because they still make consumer electronics, you know? Mm. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a weird one. Well, okay, so if we were going to actually ruin... Sony ruin Sony, and uh, you can you can say it's the PlayStation Six. You can say it's a new exclusive PS Five game, something like that. I don't know. So it's not ruin Sony Corporation. It's ru- ruin Sony Computer Entertainment. Ruin right? the PlayStation. Yeah. Kill the PlayStation brand. Okay, this this is how you kill uh, Sony Computer Entertainment. Uh, you pivot to video. Ah. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. What does all that mean? All FMV games all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it means it becomes Sony Pictures. Uh, okay, so, so I was, I mean, I, my, I was just going to say, since I believe we're running out of time, it's uh, obviously a point David Cage is CEO, is obviously, <laughs> the, right? Like, I mean, duh, put, mm-hmm. make him head mm-hmm. of Global Studios. I was hoping someone would get that. That was the correct answer. Uh, so Bingo! Is, I uh, almost got there. I was. You I was almost like, got it. You could have done it. You commissioned you were them to do Jack and Daxter or something. I don't know, but like that's as, that's as far as I got. Oh, okay. yeah. we're, we're almost out of time, but I do. I want. I, I mean, for me, it's going to be double down on the uh, multimedia franchisation of all their products, right? Like the mm-hmm. fucking Walking Dead. Not Walking Dead. God. Um, the, <laughs> I, ugh, <laughs> is it different though? Truly, like doing a it's, zombie it's like, show. It, now it's it's so hard to like uh, the walking dead is like 12 different things by default right yeah it's yeah. like two different tv shows a comic book a novel it's a game. been on for 400 years yeah and it, and it's all like different characters in different situations the last of us could very clearly just be a yeah. the, the walking dead uh a uh, special event or whatever. No, but right? we have to learn again how uh, humans are just animals and there's no reason to ever help anyone ever. And uh, that's it. There you go. You've been spared. <laughs> Wasn't that the end of uh, 28 Days Later? That's a joke. That's also true. Why would you do this on the network that just did fucking uh, the, the post-apocalypse show that's about how actually everything's going to be fine? You know, oh, Station Eleven. Station Eleven. You just did Station Eleven, and now you can do The Last of Us. I feel like those are two diametrically opposed media properties yeah. in terms of their value. You want to appease both sides of the. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're a nihilist or an effective altruist. The good yeah. end and the bad end. As of this <laughs> recording, all 285 issues of Nintendo Power are available to download at archive.org. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, that was Frank. I, I don't want to take credit for all of it. I just filled in all the holes and said, "There, you're done, go." <laughs> Oh, really? Yep. I didn't know that you were involved in that at all. That's mm-hmm. incredible. Frank Zavaldi, everybody. Uh, c- can we get an applause sound effect in here? Uh, the closest I have is this. <laughs> 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 Terrific. That's yeah, pretty close. All right. That, close <laughs> enough. Why not, right? It's the only real necessary human emotion is that one right there. For listeners uh, unfamiliar with how to download magazines, what do they need to do in order to do that? And are there any particular issues or features that our audience might be interested in checking out? Um, first of all, if you want to download that whole set from the Internet Archive, do it. Well, it's it'll probably be too late by the time this episode comes out. But uh, if it's not, just go do it now if you want it, because um, future uh, in particular is I'm not going to say litigious. They're very um, takedown heavy at the Internet Archive. And while they didn't produce the first, you know, couple decades of the magazine or whatever, they did produce the last few and uh, i imagine they will issue a takedown um probably five minutes ago um so go do that but uh if it's not on the internet archive uh, retromags.com will have all of them individually just not as a nice neat set so that's how you get them so i i, I do use a lot of egms and game fans and video games and computer entertainments and uh, nintendo powers and whatnot in in uh, my videos and i very very often get people 
just in awe of the idea that I've got these perfect high resolution scans of these EGMs. They're like, I can't believe the attention to detail to uh, scan this issue of EGM in this high quality. And it's like, I don't have the heart to tell these people 99.9% .9 of the time that it's just all out there on the internet and you can download it all. I've got a folder in my NAS called The Library nice. that just has every video game magazine possibly downloadable as of 2020. Uh, I should uh, get these Nintendo powers, huh? Yeah. Yeah, they're real fun to flip through, dude. Oh, they'll be around. I'll tell you where to get them. Oh, heck yeah. Do you need like a particular program to read them easily? Is there some way? I just use the Adobe Acrobat is what I use. Well, so it really depends on who scanned it. So Retro Mags, which is uh, the website that for the most part is scanned Nintendo Power. I think they scanned almost all of them. Um, they... Um, for reasons I don't understand, use the uh, CBZ format. So you need a a CBZ reader. That's a, that's typically like a comic book format. Yeah. But for the most part, um, what you'll get from the Internet Archive, if you find them there, is is a PDF. And you know how to open a PDF. I'm not going to explain how to open a PDF to you. Yeah, I saw that CBZ stuff, which is why that's the only reason I asked. Here, here's, a, here's a little fun fact about CBZ or CBR. Uh, those are just zip and RAR. You can literally oh, rename yeah. it .zip, and it's a zip file with JPEGs in it. So that's hey, hey. pages, that's the easy way. Um, you know, Tim was bringing up how people are kind of surprised sometimes that this stuff is just out there. Um, oh, yeah. What we are working on right now at the Video Game History Foundation is, and we're, I think we just hit 100 publications. We're, we're cataloging our collection, which is essentially every magazine, um, into something that's actually very easily searchable and 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 filterable you know you can you can show every magazine from like june 95 or whatever you want to do um and and the idea is that those will lead you to scans whether they're on our site or somewhere else um so we're making that easier and more mainstream to find so tim's secret uh will will be out there that's good you too can be tim rogers <laughs> that's all it takes i'm tired of being congratulated for something i do uh uh, w with so little effort, start congratulating me for the parts that are very obviously t difficult. <laughs> uh, please, uh, not. Uh, Do you have any other easy research secrets you want to give away? Me? Uh, any of you? <laughs> um, there's nothing easier in the world than to email someone that's an expert in something, and most of the time they do actually want to talk to you. That's true. A lot of the time, they really really want to talk to you and they mm -hmm. don't even care if it's like for something that'll be on the internet or whatever it'll be they just want to share their knowledge just email college professors they have a lot of time they do they're lying if they say they don't have enough time <laughs> i got something about that though uh which is if you want to email someone a question i've noticed this thing that happens recently where people will email you to ask you if they can ask a question just ask the question and it's a, please oh, yeah. just ask the question i will answer it or i will not my yeah. favorite is when people dm me on twitter and ask me for my email address because they want to ask me a question oh yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah. the most uh maybe the most common format of a of twitter dm i get here's the 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 pro reporter tip if you want to email especially people who are very online uh and you say you just DM them the question and then ask them if they prefer to answer over email and give your email. Right. That's mm -hmm. the easiest way. If you want to take this out of the DMs, then say, hey, here's my question. Do you want to answer me through email? I think it might be easier of us to, for us to do it there. But don't ask somebody if you want to ask a question because then you will never, ever, ever get a response. Yeah. Ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I will give a, a, a research tip since the, that was a question that was asked uh, specifically mm -hmm. with the Internet Archive. A lot of people don't know you can search text contents of of archives. Oh, yeah. Um, so I know you know that, Jaffe. But um, on the home page, if you just go into the search bar, the, these little radio buttons. Uh, wow. That's, remember that term? Radio buttons? I love that term. Uh, that took um, me right back to middle school computer class. Right? That's still what they're called. Um, they pop up and one and one of them instead of metadata is search text contents and that will search through every PDF that's on the Internet Archive. Um, and you can actually do that within subsets. So like if you I don't know how to find any of this stuff because the Internet Archive is just like a giant hoarder closet. But like if you happen to find, you know, a set that the set of video game magazines, um, you can search just text contents within those instead of the entire archive, too. So that's a, that's a really easy way to pull up every video game magazine that talks about whatever it is you're researching. Here's my next question. 
What should it cost to buy a video game? No. Zero dollars. Two hundred dollars. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> all right. All right. The range is zero to two hundred. And also no. Did you know that you can get every PlayStation One, every Sega Saturn, every PC Engine C D, uh, every uh PlayStation Two, uh every Xbox, every Xbox three sixty, uh every video game on the internet archive did you know this did you know they're all they're all there for free uh, the new ones who cares who cares about anything after those uh, you can get all the good ones you get more video games that i'm going to be able to uh, appropriately enjoy over the course of the rest of my natural life for free so why buy the new stuff jerry though also i think probably around like 29 dollars for a triple a one would be good <laughs> Uh, when they're, I mean, that's usually what they wind up. Basically, if you want to know what the video game industry thinks the real price of video games is, are you ready for this? Yeah. It's whatever the game costs during the Steam sale, uh, three or more months after its release. So if you like three months after the release of the game, uh, so if it comes out the week before a Steam sale, obviously that Steam sale doesn't count. The next Steam sale after that, whatever, if it comes out in the summer, whatever its winter Steam sale price is, that's how much. The, the the video game industry thinks that that game is worth that's Ooh, i believe formula because i mean that, that's the pricing scientists uh yeah. embedded deep within the the video game publishers that's the price that's the true price of a game but if you're gonna ask me how much i want to pay for a video game or how much i should pay i'm going to tell you 100 dollars for every video game as long as the money only goes to the people who specifically worked on the game and not anyone else mm-hmm. yeah. and it should be distributed evenly um, and they should all get uh, uh, residuals from sales in perpetuity. Hey, Brandon, I know how much Demon School should cost. Yeah, how much is that? <laughs> 100 US dollars. Oh, 100 US dollars, yeah. Please. Um, so I, I think that that formula that Tim's talking about it only only kind of works for some situations. Cause of, of Big course, AAA like, games. Yeah, or, yeah uh, because of course for... A but it, like it applies mine. for more games than that as well. I mean, there, it applies. It's it's a nice general rule. I would a lot call. of the time we discount because we're desperate for more money uh, because we don't have enough, and we're like, maybe this Steam sale will get people to buy it some more when they weren't buying it because we need to have money at any price. Because like that's Humble Bundle's whole model um, for ages was basically like our game isn't selling anymore. How can we sell it again? And and so you wind up selling like. A million copies of your game for a dollar, uh, which is like, okay, I got a million bucks, which is great, but um, you've devalued the whole thing. So it, it, it gets into a weird, a weird situation. Actually, I would love to sell a million copies of a game for a dollar. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, it's, that's, it's a tough one. I don't know how much, I think there's a, there's a weird scaling thing because like I spoke to some publishers in Japan about demon school to see if they wanted to distribute it there and like give it an extra distribution boost in japan and one particular publisher was like well since it's an indie game you can't charge more than ten dollars for this and it was like shoot uh, that's not what's happening <laughs> that's that's not the reality of this video game that we spent like six years on we're not we're not charging no ten dollars uh it's gonna be significantly more than that but there's there's like weird perceptions even within the game industry about what things should cost. Uh, I was very surprised yeah. by that ten dollar thing. I don't think any no publisher over here would say it that. Reminds me a little bit of uh, I grew up. Uh, my mom teaches at Wesleyan, and I was living there when the ba- when the band MGMT was becoming popular. Oh, I know those guys. Yeah. Um, they were friends with my next door neighbors who uh, my next Shoot. door neighbor went to Wesleyan and this was in the same class as them. They would play basketball there all the time. And they told the girl that lived there in that family that I think she <laughs> were not friends at all. <laughs> at the time in high school, we were friends. And she was like, yeah. So they brought all the songs to this the major label and they put all the songs through some kind of mathematical formula. And they came back with all these very detailed notes on how oh, long yeah. the hooks should be and what lyrics to add or discard or if the song just needs to be like 30 to 40 seconds longer to optimize a radio airplay for a single. And that absolutely is what reminds me of this or the Steam sale formula is that there's some person some business head at all these companies that's pricing like, scientists op- pricing scientists optimizing shit all the time it, all pricing the time. scientist is an actual uh job uh description by the way 
That's not amazing. some joke word I made up. It could be. <laughs> it, it, no, I mean it really is. A, it, it, it really is a. I, I interviewed one for a thing a long time ago. Uh oh man. So I now that now that the uh, the discourse the body is cold. I can freely admit that I do think seventy dollars for a remake of The Last of Us Part One is a little bit too much <laughs> at the very least. I'll leave it at that. And a lot of people asking, they're dying for my opinion. They really wanted my take. That game is becoming Skyrim to me, where it's just like, what, am I going to play on my fridge? Or are you going to try to get this running like on like, a calculator soon? I, I, how much, many times we need to be subjected to human misery? Man, yes. I, bought, I bought Skyrim so many times, and I like hate that game. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's I like hate. every time, a Steam sale, it's like it'll be 10 bucks. So uh, Todd Howard thinks Skyrim is ten bucks. So I mean, I mean, it's like I guess after Sky- Skyrim has been out for eleven years now. Uh, so I, I do believe uh, it's definitely in its ten bucks phase. Uh, it's interesting that it's not in its two bucks phase yet. Um, yeah. you know- and I, I mean, also all the uh, PlayStation Five exclusive games are sixty nine ninety nine by default, right? Isn't that mm-hmm. just, that's just the price now? In Japan, Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy games have always been one hundred dollars. I don't know if I, I feel like I've mentioned this before. If you haven't heard it before, that's the truth. Every Final Fantasy and every Dragon Quest game has, from the beginning, always been a minimum of one hundred dollars for the, the. I mean, the standard edition uh, uh, from for all time. They've they've always been. So um, I I feel like a Dragon Quest game is the perfect uh, encapsulation of a video game that is worth a hundred dollars, uh, even though the money doesn't all go to the developers. It goes to some really old wrinkly dudes so that they can make uh nfts on the blockchain yeah. uh, now is what they want to do over there yuji hori may love slot machines but i don't think he's ever going to personally uh, not personally do an nft well yeah square enix is like they're 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 really going for that but i just wanted to mention that uh actually i saw a video game history foundation tweet the other day that was oh, about I know, I know that. Get, getting five dollars off of a sega genesis with a with a sonic or a super nintendo with a mario and um and i was just it made me remember that in that era even during the time there was no way that i was that i or anyone in my family was paying the amount of money like it was it wasn't even at the like peak price but it was like something like 150 bucks for a genesis and a game and like that that was just that was literally never going to happen in the contemporary era of that stuff mm-hmm. for me it was the reason i had a turbo graphics is because nobody wanted one and i could get one at the used game shop for twenty dollars i got every video game i ever had way back when uh on sale for cheap using uh subterfuge i believe i've mentioned this on the podcast before we're just kind of standing around in front of the convenience store now just repeating things we've said before i'm gonna yep. do one uh i got my sega saturn when I worked at Target, I worked at uh, Target for eight years, in case nobody knew that about me. Um, and I, I put the Sega Saturn, uh, which was clearance, uh, I put it into the uh, the employee hold room, and I hid it under a bunch of a bounty and brawny paper towels that were for some reason in there. And uh, uh, I just waited until the computer marked it down to $12, which happened. And then yep. I felt okay about it because uh, there was still a, you know, I mean, there was still a bunch of games on the shelf, too. And the computer marked all those down to about two or three dollars. That's how I experienced the Sega Saturn. And also, you know how I experienced Final Fantasy three for the Super Nintendo was God darn Coles. Uh, Coles, first of all, in my experience, didn't have no video games nowhere. No Coles we'd ever been to had ever had video games. It had had clothes that my mom made fun of for being expensive. They, they, they did not have video games. And there was an ad in Coles that said they had Final Fantasy three just Final Fantasy 3 was the only video game sandwiched between some clothes and like footballs. There was just a picture of Final Fantasy 3 for Super Nintendo for 42.96 was the price. What a specific It was 79.99 at Electronics Boutique. I took that ad. The guy at Electronics Boutique was so mad at me, but he <laughs> sold it to me for 42.96. It was a price match. Oh, what does I'm he care? so glad that he stuck to his word on that shit, <laughs> some, that rocks. <laughs> some rogue agent within Coles, yeah. heroically. <laughs> I'm going to make some little boy's day today. Inserted Final <laughs> Fantasy. They did not have any video games. And if they did, it would have been stuff like Home Alone, the video game, uh, Home Improvement, the video game. It, they would not have had 
Final Fantasy 3 for Super Nintendo. I definitely miss video rental stores also cuz I got so oh, many yeah. used video games and I played yep. I played Digimon Adventure and because I could take it home to my PlayStation where my save file was, I could rent that oh, shit yeah. multiple times and finish it, you know? Except it didn't finish cuz there was a scratch on the disc at a specific encounter it would freeze every single time. Oh dang. One thing that sucks about being a little bit older than that is uh we still had we we you know by the time PlayStation games were a thing, I had a I had a job and uh i was able to get my employee discount and just buy the games i uh, i had to do my whole youth with video games with battery backups meaning that i would lose my save every uh, time i re-rented the game that's and so then- that's so sad especially for game uh, game boy games i remember being disappointed Shoot. Learning, learning about that when i was a child where uh, i would i would borrow something from a friend and they'd have to take it back and then they they give it to me again i'd be like get a new game and take the say the 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 fucking zelda game back that i borrowed and all my shit would be gone and i would just was so so sad <laughs> I, I've mm. told this story before as well, but uh, my Final Fantasy three experience, I, I had a real good time with my first rental, and then my second rental, someone had saved over all three save files with a save that was still at the very beginning of the game uh, uh, with just uh, Tara and Locke in the party, uh, and Oof. Tara was named the B-word. So <laughs> No! Yeah, and that was all <laughs> three saves, and they were all saved within... I guess within a minute of each other because they had identical timers. So that was very, very upsetting. I would have been inconsolable. This must have been my older brother forbid me from playing uh, his video games. Super Nintendo stuff, Genesis stuff. Yeah, he's he's uh, my dad is a, worked in IT, so he bought us these consoles as sort of like fun technological toys for himself and also for my older brother specifically. They were gifts to him. So I we we had the Super Nintendo. We still have the light guns from Duck Hunt somewhere in our basement. I found one of them and I can't find the other. And uh, Ravi would be. So specific, if he was leaving the house for any reason, he would be like, I will put all of your Barbies in the garbage disposal if you Oof. touch this shit. Barbies in the garbies. So Barbies I, in the garbies. Barbies in the garbies. I was so upset by that. I did once secretly <laughs> put in the disc for Final Fantasy X into the PS2 and just watched the opening cutscene and got so freaked out by how hyper-realistic everything looked that I got terrified and immediately <laughs> took the unplugged it and like went into my bedroom and hid under the cover. That's, that's, that's really good. That happened to me this year playing Elden Ring. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's too much. I can't take it. The, the last time that happened to me, it was when I was playing a scary game. I still can't play scary games. I love horror movies, but I can't play scary games. I was playing Amnesia the Dark Descent. I was playing it at my parents' house. They won't let me do shit until like they all go to bed, basically. So if I wanted to play a video game, I'd have to wait until midnight when everyone was asleep. And so it would be dead silent. And I got to the first part where a monster showed up in Amnesia and it made the noise. And then I force quit the program, dragged it to the trash and emptied my trash. And that was it. I was never going to play that video game again. All right. I want to Earlier quickly point year, something out, though. Yeah. Uh, Gita was was missing uh, game rental shops. Uh, I want to tell you about Gamefly.com right now sells their their, their unwanted uh, previous rentals. So oh, if, if great. you want... If you want that experience, uh, I just went to Switch and sorted by price, and you could buy something called uh, Stranded Deep for fourteen ninety nine right God, now. There was wow. there was nothing like walking into Blockbuster and seeing a whole bunch of games that nobody wanted to rent on, like for sale at twenty dollars. Mm-hmm. That God. really was just like g- giving yourself a little pinata party, basically, where it's like, what's all of these with a weird off brand candy that's always in a pinata anyway. Stranded Deep is the former rental of video games, is, is the, the takeaway here. Got it. I was going to say, I've got 90,000 video games on a thing the size of a pinky fingernail, so... Yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, you know... My my experience with all that with the uh, Final Fantasy 3 and such was that uh, because I was in that situation where I was just buying whatever was cheap and I, I couldn't afford the, the stuff contemporarily and contemporaneously, I don't know how to say that word, I got Final Fantasy 3 in like 1998 from my buddy who was selling his super nintendo what because the playstation was at you know um so like i was experiencing a lot of these things much later than they than they were new i didn't even know about games i didn't even consider that games come out and then you buy them at that time (laughs) it was just not part of my life until much later 
Uh, so, yeah. Uh, it's fun times, though, with those older things. I like them. All right. While we're uh, reminiscing on times past, I'd like to shift the topic here. Uh, earlier this year, video game director, producer, and artist Rieko Kodama passed away at age 58. With her work on Sonic the Hedgehog, Altered Beast, Fantasy Star, and Skies of Arcadia, how much of the spirit of Sega do we owe to Rieko, and what legacy has she left us? Yeah, this, uh, it was a big surprise that we all found out about this basically through a memorial in the Genesis Mini 2 mm -hmm. that came out, or the Mega Drive Mini 2, and uh, someone found that screenshot and said that said that it was like in memory of her and we were like oh, what's going on um and it turned out that she passed away uh several months ago i think it was in may yep and so it one one thing that i'm happy about is that we were able to give her a lifetime achievement award while she was still alive at gdc uh, she wasn't able to come and she wasn't able to come because of health issues which is what they didn't say that at the time publicly but that was she was having health issues and so that's why she didn't fly out but we were able to kind of like celebrate her life while she was alive and to me like there are m multiple branches of what sega means and i wouldn't say that she's like super responsible for the sonic branch or whatever especially not where it is now but for like the weirdo stuff i feel like she's really deep in there with with all of the I don't know. She she had two end caps on the Saturn. <laughs> like the Magic Knight Rare Earth was one of the first games that came out on the Saturn in, in Japan and was the last game that came out on Saturn in the US. Uh, Deep Fear, which she also worked on, was the last game that came out on the Saturn in Europe. Not to be confused with Stranded Deep. No. That's right. Stranded Deep is a, is a different game. It's completely different, yeah. Um, but like, I think what I appreciated most about her work is that she made games that were truly for everybody, but which represented, which had a, like a variety of different character types, had like a female protagonist or whatever, so that people could, uh, all kinds of people could enjoy it. But it wasn't like games for girls uh, yes. in a pejorative sense. It was like, so like Magic Knight Rare Earth. Uh, I was is... about to say. Go ahead. I was looking up her career because I'm less familiar with her work than you guys are. And I was thinking to myself, it's such a shame I didn't get a chance to play any of these as they were coming out. But then I realized I had played one of them. I downloaded a copy of Magic Knight Rare Earth uh, when I was in middle school, I think, because I was reading the manga. And it really... It set me up for some failure, I think, in terms of how I approached games from there on out, because it it made me, this game was just a really good RPG, and it wasn't an RPG for girls, like very much the manga is a story for girls and about girls. It was just a very well-designed, very good video game, and it made, me, it made me assume that the rest of video games would be as approachable to the yeah. kinds of stories that girls like without labeling them girls' stories, you know? Mm -hmm. Totally. This, it was just like a lovely, lovely experience as a little girl to play something that took me seriously and wasn't kind of making fun of me. It was pretty interesting to play this game. Um, I played it and it, it was I played it like five years ago and uh, my partner was enjoying it, enjoying watching it and then just took over playing it. And it's not like she doesn't get into action games or things like that. It's just they don't usually grab her in a particular way that makes her feel compelled to continue with them and and yet magic knight rare earth is that that's like the one saturn game that she has played and beaten <laughs> because wow. it was just it just like there's something about the way that um ryuko kodama thinks about things like when you when you watch interviews with her she's like i'm not trying to be a woman in video games or whatever i'm not trying to like be the the female icon or whatever i'm just trying to make video games but the video games that she makes have a sensibility that is way more inclusive and uh approachable to a wider variety of people just by virtue of how her brain works i guess yeah it's there's a lot of um the story is not presented as a gendered story yeah in in this game the yeah, manga it's just an adventure 
Yes, exactly. And the manga is similar in that way. They're lucky that, you know, the Mm. manga itself has some very, the classic clamp character designs and character archetypes that are really appealing, I think, just to to women and girls. But the story itself is presented as, here's an adventure story, just like all of the other RPGs you've played. And even if there are aspects to it that are just more feminized, especially because there's three female lead characters, it was never... Uh, the context of that never changes. It never becomes like a sort of girl story in the same way that you see. I don't know, like a style savvy, I think is a very good video game that any kind of gamer should enjoy can, or could enjoy. But it is presented as a female story, as a sort yeah. of a feminized way. And this game is just, it's not doing that. It, the assumption yeah. is made not that girls need special pandering, but to, right. but that all kinds of people would play games if you give them good games and good stories. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Tim, you met her a few times, right? Oh, many times, yeah. We and there was that one time we were at Tokyo Game Show, she came up behind you while we were while we were both playing Seventh Dragon, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, I remember that. And she said something funny. She was like uh, she was like, How do you like it? or something. She was just like right behind your head. Yeah. Just immediately just being like, You like this? Uh <laughs> and she said it in uh in Japanese too, which was fun. Yeah, yeah. Because uh you know, usually, you know, there's a lot of foreign people at Tokyo Game Show who uh, are kind of standing around. Uh, most of them, I would I would use the word loitering to describe, which is weird because, you know, they're paying customers, though they still kind of have the aspect of loiterers, as I believe I did in, all, in those times. Sure. The loitering vibe. Yeah, just, uh, you know, just an overall loiter. I've just, I've been kind of loitering in the world now for 43 years. And, uh, yeah, she just came up and... Uh, you know, usually you, when someone approaches you and it says either, you know, get out or puts their arms up in a big X and says no photo. Back in those days, they believed that if anyone took a photo of anything at Tokyo Game Show, then the company would go bankrupt. Right. So yeah. I was just uh, immediately sensing the approach of a person behind me. I, I thought, oh, am I about to get kicked out for just playing this video game? Man, uh, in, uh, this is a, a quick tangent here. There's several times at Tokyo Game Show. I would be playing a video game, like an RPG, something with a lot of text, and uh, someone from the booth would come up and go, excuse me, can you please let this person play? And, uh, like, I had, like, just gotten there, and uh, they were, like, just, like, like gesturing to the next person in line, because they're like, you clearly can't read the words in this game. Can you let this person from this country who can read the words play the game instead? And I was like, why don't you just make your games visually and... uh, impressive uh instead of uh, relying on the text so much and also i can't read it anyway i thought i was up for one of those and then it turned out it was just rieko kodama and she was like what do you think and i was like oh that's cool and uh yeah she gave me your business card i i inter- interviewed her for a couple of things uh she's cool cool as heck <laughs> cool as heck i mean it's a couple i want to mention a couple of games i i've i have no please do yeah go interaction go with her as a it. person but i've interacted with her games um she was one of the directors, maybe the, the the lead. I don't know. I'm not sure of the structure uh, on Fantasy Star Four, and mm-hmm. uh, I think that game's still fantastic. Like as a, an old JRPG with a PH. Uh, yes, it's 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 yeah. it's, it's, it's fantastic. Yes, fantastic. <laughs> uh, I actually, in my interview, I asked her how it's supposed to be pronounced, and she said it is supposed to be pronounced Fantasy Star. <laughs> she did <So>. not. <laughs> You can't do that because she can't correct you. That's not okay. That's, right. That's not fair. <laughs> if, if he wants kind of a weird insert credity game that, that's kind of got her all over it, Spellcaster on the Master System. Mm. Very strange, like, combination of side-scrolling and then sort of, like, whatever you'd call, like, a Japanese console adventure game kind of thing, you know? Like, like move, examine, that sort of thing. Like, you do both of those things in this game. Yeah, they hadn't figured out what the template video game was at that point. So yeah, Master System is home to a lot of little weird ones like that. And that's 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 Kodama and Oshima. Like it's it's you know yeah. it's 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 Proto kind of Sonic like, Team. Proto Sonic Team. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's really weird and interesting. And I'm not gonna say good, but it's it, it's insert credits trademark. A real seven out of people 10. should really play that first Fantasy Star. We've talked about it on here yeah. before, but mm-hmm. play the mm-hmm. play the M2. Play the Sega Ages one for Nintendo Switch, yeah. Yeah, you get your sixty. 60- no, no, play play my script. Come on. <laughs> well, oh, Frank's the Frank the Frank Safaldi remaster. 
as it's yeah, called. Yeah, I, I worked on a, a retranslation patch, and uh, it's. Patch. I think it's. I think it's really, really good. Uh, it's yeah. the SMS Power patch, and uh, man, we we actually tried to get it in that M2 product, but they just couldn't clear it in time. Dang. Like M2 wanted to. Oh man, M2 rules. Yeah. Oh, and one more thing about Rieko Kodama. Okay, so okay. I'm a huge fan of non Nintendo Zeldas. If you all knew this. Yeah. Um, my favorite Zelda game of all time is easily Landstalker, right? And I can I can back that up, and someday I will. Um, and uh, Magic Knight Ray Earth is also very high on my list. I'm not going to give you my list, my ranked list of best uh, non Nintendo Zelda games, though I have played all of them, love them all. You know, even Community Palm, I like that game. Uh, I know Brandon likes that one. Yeah, uh, I also like Brave Story. I, sorry, not Brave Story. Uh, Brave Proof. <laughs> Brave, Brave proof. proof. Brave Proof is yeah. all right. Yeah. Brave, Brave Proof kind of kind of sucks. I mean, it does kind of suck, but it also kind of rules. Yeah, I mean, stuff about it rules uh, overall. Whew, uh, not a good game. I would say by any stretch, I believe, is an appropriate phrase to uh, throw out here. Though um, <laughs> so I do love it. I still love it. Um. Anyway, Magic Knight Ray Earth is very, very, very high up on my list, which yeah. uh, is crowned by Landstalker as one of the best non-Nintendo Zeldas. It's a little not as much as Zelda as Landstalker. Anyway, when I inter- when I when I when I sat down with Rieko Kodama, we I got to telling her that I, I liked Landstalker and she just talked about Landstalker for like 30 minutes. So, about how much she liked it. The so, right side of history. So, uh, uh to Rieko Kodama. Thank you. For liking Landstalker and also Thank you. for making Magic Knight Rare Earth. You may have seen there there were a bunch of dreamcast retrospectives that went around um in 2019 because it was the it was the 20th anniversary yeah. 20th anniversary and she got interviewed because obviously she did skies of arcadia and or she was the producer and um people loved it and stuff and they were asking her like what could have what could have been done to make the dreamcast succeed more or or like what what were the what were the issues and what 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 do you remember about it and she was just like, if only we had, we had made better games, then people would have, the Dreamcast would have wow. succeeded and people would have bought wow. it. And I was like, dude, no, that's exactly wrong. The games are, were great. Like, don't put it on yourself. Like the, the, um, but it really sounded like she was, uh, taking personal responsibility for, for like, I don't know, Skies of Arcadia, Eternal Arcadia, not setting the world on fire with sails or something like that. But like, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It, 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 there was something about that particular interview that really struck me that like, she's really been working at this company for a really long time. She's really, all of her she's, adult life, yeah. all of her adult life. And, uh, it's truly very personal to her, like whether this stuff <laughs> does well, I don't know. I, I don't really have a full takeaway, but it, it just really struck me when she was like, yeah, if only we if only we had made better games on the Dreamcast, Sega would be in a different spot. It's like, yeah, I, I talked to her about Skies of Arcadia quite a bit, uh, and uh, you know, many years later, she had uh, quite a bit of granular criticisms of that game. You know, I mean, I don't think you need to be a, a any kind of a detective to figure out what some of them are. Obviously, you can't make a thing and and also like it at the same time most of yeah. the time. So beautiful game though, Skies of Arcadia, oh, yeah. love it. Love that I think game. we'll hear a little bit more of that soon, yeah? Yeah, no, uh, my main context for Skies of Arcadia is my, my dear friend Harper, who has a Skies of Arcadia tattoo. It does seem like a uniquely special object that inspires obsession, which is always, to me, the most fascinating kind of art, art that just makes people truly obsessed. And also an excellent uh, ongoing, uh, in-progress Skies of Arcadia novelization. Uh yeah. If you all want to read that. I think we'll hear a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, We'll be right back after a few words from some more of our friends. Thank you to our contributors, Harper J., Vincent Diamante, Azure Lore Corrigan, and Mark Cerny for helping us remember Rieko. It is impossible to number the invisible people who change our lives, the people who do it without even meaning to. In the rare event that we're able to identify these fantastic souls, we run into all sorts of realities. We learn that they're across the globe. We learn that they lived a hundred years ago. We, we learn that people from all, all sorts of places can affect us. 
Now, I don't think it's fair to say that Reiko Kodama's career was invisible by any stretch of the imagination. That is certainly not true. But I think it is fair to say that countless people have benefited from her guiding hand without even knowing it. And that's because her touch was remarkably subtle and incredibly humble. Her art helped shape the Sega aesthetic. The vibrancy of Fantasy Star's futuristic vision, the playfulness of Alex Kidd, the coy mischief of Sonic the Hedgehog, all these things promised worlds that were fantastical and infectiously enticing. This alone would be enough to cement her place in games history, but Kodama-san also pushed the very nature of game stories into fresh territories as she helped imagine worlds with diverse heroes. Fantasy Star's cast includes a female heroine and androgynous wizard alongside its burly weapon master. Skies of Arcadia follows a trio of young heroes that avoids uh, romance cliches that were so common to RPGs at the time. It tells a sweeping and inclusive story that I know has reached fans of a wide range of identities and persuasions and ages. If you look at a list of games that Kodama-san worked on, they are invariably the product of eclectic teams with diverse interests, and it's clear that Kodama-san was an essential piece of those creative puzzles. When I asked Kodama-san about the female leads in Skies of Arcadia, her response was simply that they were meant to be on the same footing as the male protagonist, not to be saved by him. And indeed, this is the fundamental quality of her works. Anyone could be a hero. Everyone had a place at the table. We don't need to wait for somebody else to take the lead and drag us into a better future. We stand tall, grin confidently at the odds, and we change the world ourselves. Better yet, we can do it together. Now, these sentiments are not radical today in games or in real life, although it can sometimes feel that way. But it's hard to deny that Kodama-san played a large part in building out styles and sensibilities that embraced a fundamentally romantic image of what games could be. Games could be global, they could speak to all people, they can help us visualize astonishing possibilities for the future. Our games, particularly the brightest and most forward-thinking of our games, stand upon the works that Reiko Kodama was involved with as an artist, as a producer. Her touch is there, intimately. Whether you're a deep fan of her contributions or one of the many people invisibly touched by her creativity, there's no doubting her effect on the wonderful world of video games. Hey, this is Vincent Diamante. Um, Just wanted to share a little story. But back when I was a kid, I played NES games. That was really my main thought when it came to what a video game was. It was the stuff that I was playing on NES. I didn't realize that at the time, but all the things that I was playing, um, they were arcade ports. Things like Jackal and Contra or Bump and Jump and other things from Konami, Vic Tokai, those guys. Um, and I had no clue what a role-playing game was back then. I, I I wasn't really in the know. I didn't follow magazines. I I didn't know about any of that stuff. But I do remember when I was about 10 years old, I was hanging out at a family gathering. And my cousin there, he wasn't really with the rest of the family. He was holed up in his bedroom. And he was playing a game. And of course, me being a 10-year-old kid, I'm like, hey, there's something cool on the TV. I want to check out what that thing was. And I look there and I I see some text and I clearly remember that there was a big choice in front of him there where he had to choose a a bride, uh, choose who to marry. And I was so struck by that, the magnitude of that type of choice. Uh, That was the first time I really thought of that. I didn't play computer uh, adventure games, and I certainly didn't play role-playing games up to this point. So when I see that on the screen, I thought, wow, this is something different. And this cousin would go on to introduce me to the whole world of role-playing games, both on console as well as uh, tabletop and paper-based role-playing games. So, Sean, 
thanks a lot for introducing me to this world. But also thanks, Kodama-san, for being a part of helping me discover what else a video game could be besides those action and sports games that I was playing as a kid. Uh, thanks for Fantasy Star. Thanks for Skies of Arcadia. Uh, thanks for Magic Knight Ray Earth, which is so incredibly charming. Thanks for everything. I was in a perfect sort of storm to read everything into everything that I played because it was my whole world to me. I didn't have anything else. And so I put myself in the game and I extrapolated and I thought about how it felt and why things were as they were. And from that perspective, as much as I liked my NES, there was always something that grabbed me about the Master System. The things that they built were interesting. The games were simpler as games, but as statements, they had so many more layers. So much of that sublime liminality can be summed up in that little phrase, blue skies, but it's so much more than that. That's just an indication of the kind of underlying spirit under the choices that Sega has consistently made over the years for how it wants people to interact with the things that it says. Sega very clearly had a perspective. It was optimistic about the ability of people to make meaningful change in the world. And the people who made that change, and the people who were affected by that change, Sega's games tended to treat with a sort of egalitarianism that was unusual at the time. It's not just that Fantasy Star, which came out the same week as Final Fantasy, has a meaningful story, as simple as it is, based on personal motivation. And it's not just that it has individual characters, as simple as they are. And it's not even that its protagonist is one of the first few really strong, notable central female characters in a video game. It's that there's nothing really all that special about Alice in and of herself. The story isn't even really about her. She just makes it about her. Alice is living in a Star Wars-influenced sci-fi kingdom that's recently been taken over by a tyrannical authoritarian monster. And her brother Nero, he should have been the hero. <laughs> in some other story, he would have been. He was the freedom fighter who was sniffing through Lassic's affairs in order to prove what was going on and show the people what they had to fight against together. But in the opening sequence, we see Nero struck down and his little sister Alice run to his side. As he dies, she promises Nero that he won't have died in vain and that she's going to keep on investigating what he was looking into. And she doesn't know what she's doing. And again, the game is simple. It doesn't really make sense. It's just told in little snippets of conversation, but it does have a story. And it's all based on this motivation of this girl who just saw her brother killed by a tyrannical government and decided to look into what it was that he was fighting for. It's this kind of a humble, possibly foolhardy, individualistic, and pluralistic rejection of authority, as well as this stubborn insistence on people looking out for each other. That sort of spirit has been there since the mid-80s in so many things that Sega has done. But that sort of stubborn insistence on fairness is ingrained in so many games from Sonic the Hedgehog to Jet Set Radio to Skies of Arcadia to Panzer Dragoon. It's never just action, and it's never just disruption. It's always for a purpose, and that purpose is collective liberation. And rightly or wrongly, so much of that spirit, I'm inclined to attribute to Rieko Kodama, who started as an artist and very quickly worked her way up the ranks, as it were. One of the most respected members of any team that she was a part of. Always eager to, as Brandon wrote elsewhere, deliver games that weren't just for girls, but but that were for everybody to enjoy. And it's reductive and unfair and silly to put so much on one person's shoulders, especially when we're talking about not raising any one person above anyone else, except by the things that they do. But I think that the things that Kodama did and the influence that she had on others from her presence went a long way to inform the spirit that surrounded her. Which certainly, in visual terms, Rieko Kodama was central in establishing. If you think of the way that Sega games looked in the 1980s, early 90s, that was basically her. These charismatic characters, 
full of personality. Broad, mushy gestures, bright colors, usually these blue skies, yes. On some level, it just feels like everything really came back to her for like a gut check. That's just my impression as somebody who spent the bulk of her life thinking about this stuff. I've got a pretty good idea of what kind of a world I want to build so that I can live in it. And no small part of that is due to these silly phosphor dots dancing in the darkness. But decades ago, this one woman drew with a light pen in a dark room after hours to meet some arbitrary deadline set by the men ahead of her. Any one of us can do so many things to make such a difference in somebody else's life. And what so much of that comes down to is just believing in something, believing in us, believing that we can do better, that we should do better, and that maybe, maybe tomorrow we can start. Hello again. It's me, Brandon Sheffield. I'm recording a message that was sent to me by Mark Cerny, who, as I'm sure you know, worked at Sega for quite a long time. He had things to say, but didn't feel that he could uh, put them into words vocally while he was writing this, so he sent it to me to read, and it is the following. It was heartbreaking to hear that Ryoko Kodama had died. Like most everyone else, I had no idea that she had passed until the Genesis game credits triggered various media coverage, and it felt strange to see all of those articles about her legacy, and the usual reductive conversation on the game boards about how important or unimportant that legacy was, because it really had nothing to do with how she was as a person. As a person, and I've got tears in my eyes again as I write this, so please forgive me for not recording, she was wonderful. I've never heard an unkind word about her. We worked out of the same bullpen in Tokyo for a number of years, cranking out Master System titles, and I can tell you that for her, being a game creator came from a place of confidence and competence, not a place of ego. Such a well-rounded person, too, which was exceptional within our little band of geeks. We kept contact to some degree after I came back to the US. We exchanged Christmas cards for a number of years. The last time I saw her was over a coffee during the run-up to PlayStation 4. It was so nice to chat and remember those times when we were young and video games themselves were young and fresh, and we were all just trying to put the pieces together as best we could and find our way forward. Kodama-san, I miss you. I'd love to see you again. I'm hoping the universe is a kind enough place to make that possible. If you're interested in sharing stories or your thoughts on her legacy, You can join us on the post for this episode on forums.insertcredit.com. Let's get back to the show. Welcome back to Insert Credit. You know what? I feel like going right into the lightning round. Let's finish up this episode. Wait, there's not a dirt bag? We can't do a dirt bag? I like the dirt bag. Okay, fine. I'll back up. Let's do the dirt. Lightning, then dirt. That's because a Pokemon came out today, so we should... We should stress the lightning dirt dichotomy. Let's do dirt, then we'll do lightning. That's that's not a, that's actually not a Pokemon type. Uh, that's fine. Lightning doesn't uh, hurt dirt Pokemon, does it? Uh, dirt hurts lightning. Dirt hurts lightning. Yeah, it's does a it? grounding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> you say so, dude. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't. I don't know, dude. Okay. okay. The way the dirt bag works is we take one of the questions submitted to us through Patreon.com/slash Insert Credit, where patrons for mere dollars a month can get access to a form that allows them to submit those questions, get monthly bonus episodes, and other sweet treats throughout the schedule as we deem fit to share them. Uh, This week's question comes from Kiko, who asks, is it ever worthwhile to play all the way through a game you hate? What can you learn from that experience? Shoot! Mm -hmm. Oh, good good question. question. It's a really good question, because I think we all agree that just playing a game we hate has merit, but finishing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, finishing is definitely, that's, I feel like maybe once, (laughs) maybe once it's worth doing that. But, Afterward, maybe not, because you get it at a certain point. Oh, yeah. It's not going to get better, and you're not going to... There, there's people out there, though, who like to... Um, they like to hate play things or hate finish things. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It's a it's a whole category of uh, of internet content. Yeah, and, and I think there's a way to do that without being a jerk also. So, oh, like, yeah. I... I appreciate, so here's, this is a weird case where I think it's a, it's, 
you should finish a game that you don't like is that if you're making a tool assisted speed run and you don't like the game, it's great to great to finish it because then I can look at all the weird stuff in that game and I and as quickly as possible and I don't ever have to play it. Uh, and that's that's fantastic and I love it. Por la cultura. Yeah, yeah. This was a piece of advice that Alan Moore gave in his weird BBC masterclass thing, but I, mm -hmm. I have been following this piece of advice prior to this, and I just think it's good for if you want to make any kind of art, you should not just interact with the piece of art in that medium that you feel like is good. You should also seek out and truly, thoroughly and like analyze the stuff that you think is bad. Because mm -hmm. it will tell you a lot about what your own value systems in terms of art actually are. Yeah, this this goes beyond like the seven out of ten uh, like IGN bad yeah. that we like mm -hmm. to talk about. That I feel like every the zeitgeist now is everyone's talking about seven out of ten games. Uh, I've seen a lot of seven out of ten games discourse. This goes beyond the seven out of ten games discourse. It. It goes beyond to the God Hand got a three out of ten, uh, but actually it's a masterpiece discourse. Uh, it's like stuff that got a three out of ten and deserves it. Like mm -hmm. it is – I think it's on – I used to brag that I could tell within five minutes if a game was uh, a, a three out of ten or a, or a ten out of ten or whatever. And I, for the most part, I think my intuition remains uh, however sharp it was in those days, though I do say now it takes me about an hour I like to find bad video games and play them for a for an hour. I put put an hour on the clock and then give it an hour. And I think there's there's real legitimate value in finding a game that by all accounts you can tell it's not good that it does a lot of stuff wrong and playing it for an hour. I think I don't think you need to beat these games. Yeah. Uh, this is how I felt when I was playing Cult of the Lamb, which I think is, I mean, a well-designed game and I think has a really good uh, UI UX design and also character design. I think the art direction in the game is extremely good, but I think its systems are a little half-baked. I think it's, uh, especially its resource management sort of stuff that is the stuff I love doing. I wanted to max out that skill tree. I wanted to see how long it would take me to max out that skill tree. And I played the game for exactly as long as it took me to do that. And I realized I didn't want to do anything else in the game. But by doing that, I think I learned a lot more about resource management sims and what makes them work than if I had not played that game. I think I still would have had some half-baked ideas about my criticisms of how, sometimes how these systems enact themselves. But now that I, I took the time to play something I wasn't really sure I enjoyed all the way, I, I feel like I'm a, a more knowledgeable person afterward. I think that kind of going on what you were saying earlier about um, you know learning more about what you like and what you don't, I actually was just talking about this in an interview recently, how like with the friend of the show, Matthew Kumar, he and I often watch- Well- friend we we have yes we, we have <laughs> wait what <laughs> anyway uh mad kumar my friend um <laughs> he and i watch similar similar movies we, we watch a lot of movies in the same weird niche genres but we often come away with opposite opinions and it's it's interesting to have a friend where you have seen a whole bunch of the same like pretty obscure down in the depths kind of stuff and come away with different opinions about it. Like to, to be delving into the same niches and, and, and coming out feeling different is, is curious and interesting. And so to me, it's like with those movies, I'm glad I watched them to the end so that we can have a good discussion about it. And mm -hmm. that discussion helps me not only understand more about why I like the things I like and the, the, like the ways in which I like them. It also lets me learn more about my friend and how, he feels about things. And I think with, with games, there's worth in doing that. I don't know that you need to get all the way to the end unless the end is something important, but there's definitely value to playing something that your friend likes that you don't or getting your friend to play something oh, they sure. don't like, but you do. And, and having that discussion, I think to the, the discussion that. winds up being the interesting part though. Yeah. I, I developed this Herculean ability to read all the way through a book that I get nothing out of. Um, however, I can't really do it for video games. However, on the other hand, I've also learned how to like a lot of stuff in video games. Video games, like you can't, you can't uh, power through them as a hobbyist, and uh, yeah. uh, as as you can with a book or, mm -hmm. or a movie. Obviously, mm -hmm. yeah. like a lot of them, these these things are too god darn long these days. 
Too long, too difficult sometimes. And they do, yeah. I, in order to solve a puzzle, you do have to use your brain in a way yeah. that you don't have to use your brain to watch a bad movie or a bad television show. Mm-hmm. I think it's yeah. maybe more similar to the experience of reading a bad book, but even then, you can really skim in a book. You can't really skim a video game. Once you learn to speed read, you can apply that to any book. Uh, yes. You can't apply speed running to any video game. No, Unfortunately, exactly. not a transferable <laughs> no. property there, no. So as for engaging with something you hate all the way until the end and it actually giving you some sort of value, I feel like the only concrete example I have of this in my life is I think that because I watched all of Dexter, I could be a good cinematographer if I tried. Yep. Mm. Um, because Dexter is shot so poorly (laughs) and they get every shot so wrong in such a different obvious textbook way that that therein exists an entire cinematography composition staging a a, a whole film director's cornucopia curriculum uh, exists within dexter yeah i mean this is uh i had a friend i lived with in that same Hyde Park Chicago apartment and Mm -hmm. every time he was having a hard time painting he was a painter and we had an extra room we we let him use the studio and uh, every time he had a hard time painting he was like Gita I'm going to watch HBO's Girls because there's nothing like watching this to make me feel like I can actually paint (laughs) oh I love it yeah you know I, I do I think that's a great fucking strategy I really do if you feel like you can't do it yeah just watch someone do it badly I could be a best-selling author every time I think about Dexter. You could. You could. You <laughs> I think, literally I think, could. Oh, my God. I could do it. I got a video game one where I think it's, oh, let's do it's, it. it's worth it. And I think it's uh, it's fighting games. Like when you've got bad fighting games, it it's worth playing those through to the end, especially if you don't have someone to play them with because then you can yeah. actually – it's like a good way to get better at them. You can see their cheap bosses and whatever and you learn new techniques and stuff. So I think with with bad fighting games, it's actually worth finishing them because like that's all there is to it. Like you, you then have gotten the full experience. But also the, there's people out there like myself that, that love trash fighting games and, and you just want – you want to – complete the whole thing that's a certain kind of challenge where the type of infuriating that it becomes is something that you actively want to surmount rather than fully give up on because you're it's it feels like a one-on-one with the machine and and you can actually defeat it so uh i I think that's one place where it's worth doing Mm. okay uh with that i think it's time to go on to our lightning round Uh, i'm telling you the points right now gita is currently in the lead but uh, we can change that right here. This week, we're playing Localization Station. Uh, I'm going to name a video game, and you have to tell me what the name of the game was localized as in Europe. Simple. First <laughs> one to get it right wins. Our first game is Ninja Gaiden. Hero Gaiden. N- oh, God. What was That's it? what it should have been, but. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, Dark Shadow, something like that. No. Both incorrect. Brandon, Gita, you have guesses? Uh, just Ninja Gaiden in it. No, they I, couldn't say ninja. I think oh, it's yeah, ninja, right. was, ninja was a profane word. And, and Flimpty, oh, Flimpty Nampers, Crumpet, <laughs> Strumpet, right? Uh, that's close. It was Shadow, oh, wait, Shadow Warriors. Shadow Warriors. Damn it, I had it. Shadow Warriors. <laughs> <laughs> really close. What did I say? Dark something? I think you said Dark Shadows. You did I say did Dark, dark Shadows. shadows. Okay. You had Shadow uh, in there. Yeah. Uh, our next theme is Contra. Uh, Probotector. Probotector. Yeah, Probotector. Yeah. Yeah, Probotector yeah. is correct. Also, Grizor. Grizor in Europe. Probotector specifically in Europe. Grizor. Uh, Frank in England. Point. Yeah. yeah. In England specifically. Wouldn't yeah. it be so weird if the UK was real? Okay, look, look. I'm just going to. I have to object to Frank getting a point for that. There's yeah. no way that we, we all said it uh, probably at the same time. I didn't hear Frank say it when I said it. And also, you know, you know, we all know that as guys who've read EGM before. <laughs> Because it was, <laughs> I will give you the point as well, Tim. That's that's the well, go-to. Too. All of us Brand- get a point. Okay, for that one. Brandon, Nobody you get gets a point. Gita, did you say protector? Listen, I'm I'm the one that this is where the generational difference will really show through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My older brother was on this show. He'd ace this shit. <laughs> All right, uh, our next team is Star Fox. Star Wing. Uh, that is correct. Uh, Who would you give it Star-wing? to? Though? Okay, Tim got it. I oh, said it no. Frank time. said it simultaneously. Fra- okay, <laughs> another wow. point for Frank. 
I thought I thought we were going to be making joke answers for this. <laughs> yeah, me too. That's why I did that first one. You can if Mr. you don't want to get points. Mr. Fox goes to the moon is what I would have said for that one. <laughs> like, I mean, this is Captain Fox goes to the moon. I don't know. This is like the only lightning round I've ever just known answers for. So I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Frank is very excited to do the homework tonight. Uh, Star Fox 64. Oh, uh, Lilat Wars. That's correct. Oh, okay. Uh, Mi one. Mr. Fox goes to the moon 64 times. Mr. Fox goes to the 64th <laughs> Ara moon. Around the moon in 64 days. <laughs> mm. Around the moon in 64 foxen, because that's what they call multiple foxes in England. Yeah, that's right. Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. Mm. Oh, no. That does sound perverted, so I see why they change it. Harry Potter. Oh, oh I know. <laughs> Tie the Tasmanian Tiger. <laughs> yeah, that's right. My my boyfriend's favorite joke is just to say Harry Potter, but removing more and more of the consonant sounds until it's just all glottal uh, stops. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. No, that no. was in Europe, Sly Cooper Wait. and the Thievius Raccoonus. It's called Sly Raccoon. Oh, okay. That's terrible. Yeah, That's not as good. <laughs> That's way worse. It's not but as the good. entire game is just called Sly Raccoon. That's right. Uh, that just sounds like okay. some flash game or something. <laughs> yeah. Our next game is Pushmo. Pulmo. I don't know what that game is. Pushmo? Oh, it's uh, it's on the 3DS. In in uh, Italy, it's called Pushissimo. Pushissimo. <laughs> um, uh, so that's true, actually. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember what Pushmo is called. Something else. Don't know it. No. You're close. It's Pull Blocks. I knew it. I knew it. Wow, I knew it really? Something. Yeah. Uh, Half point for Pulmo. <laughs> You know what? I will give you half a point for Pullman. <laughs> God, Europe. God, Europe sucks. <laughs> yeah. Our next game is Tomba. Oh, Tomba. Oh, man. What is that called? God darn. It's, 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 oh, man. It's like, I don't remember what it is. It's, it's not like Magical Caveman Adventure, but it's something stupid like that, I think. He's got pink hair in it. Is that its name? Yeah. Something like uh, that, right? Actually, in Europe, Tomba is called Tombi. Ah. Uh, okay. Tombi, Tombi, Tombi. Yeah. Apparently because Tomba means grave in Italian, so they didn't want to do that. Oh. I just that assumed sense. it'd be like a snack that was trademarked or something. <laughs> yeah. Tomba Interesting. Rounds. Your next yeah. game is Bully. Oh. You can't just can them it. That's, That's uh, right. Just, no, it's just called school. <laughs> it's just yeah. called school. It's just called going to school. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> uh, school days 3D. <laughs> That's right. School days 3D. <laughs> A really good game. Game number nine is Mortal Kombat Deception. Oh, Hero Combat Deception. <laughs> uh, de it's because deception <laughs> means like uh, uh, failure or something. In, yeah, in French. In French. Isn't it yeah. that a deception? Mortal Kombat. Oh, it starts with a DE still, I think. Uh, um, delight. <laughs> yeah, Mortal, Mortal Kombat, Kombat delight. Designer, but with two eyes like the rapper. Mortal Kombat Dangerous yeah. Delights. <laughs> uh, it was Mortal Kombat Mystification. Oh, okay. Ooh, what? I like it. Yeah. I like that one. That's a really good. You know, my main really problem great. with this title is, is that there Mortal Kombat, there? there isn't a K What? In there. That's stupid yeah, as heck. They really what? dropped the ball there. They uh, did. It's not right. All right. No. Finally, uh, your last game is Hitler's Resurrection Top Secret. Wow. A bionic Commando. Wow. That's correct. <laughs> wow. In Japan, that yeah. game was called Hitler's Resurrection top secret they're just calling that that's just uh british history i right. can't believe you didn't throw out the most uh the best example which is that a uh, a uh, fatal frame was called project zero in europe because that's what it was announced as in an edge preview that's or, pretty good or the uh the insert credit standby uh what is michigan called in europe it's called michigan michigan right right <laughs> yeah I, I believe uh the awkwardly titled Feel the Magic XXXY was just called Rub Rabbits. Rub though, Rabbits. Rub Rabbits. Mm -hmm. Rub yeah. Rabbits. But that's what it was called in Japan too, right? Yeah. Tim, congratulations. You've gotten your ninth host point. One oh, more. No. And something special is going to happen. Fly uh, HP. <laughs> Uh, but this is the point of the show where we plug stuff that we've got going on if we are so inclined, or we just give some recommendations to our audience for things they can engage themselves with until our next episode releases. I recommend follow Gita on Twitter. She's cool. Yeah, she's oh, great. XOXO oh, Gossip That's Gita. true. One of the last good Twitters. I, I also restarted my Tumblr where I'm, this is the thing I want to recommend, actually. I restarted my Tumblr and I've been, because I wanted to reblog all of the really good Interview with the Vampire 
uh, gift sets and commentary that is going on out there. The AMC interview with the vampire is not just incredible television. Oh, yeah. It's like one of the, the gayest things that has made it to air in a time when America is particularly homophobic. And uh, you when owe America it to yourself. America needs it most. Yes, like Lestat is just the f slurriest f slur I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> like, I don't know why or how they got this actor, Sam Reed, or what is in the water in Australia, but he's perfect. It's like he's been possessed by Lestat. And the show itself makes a lot of changes to the source material, but in really thoughtful and intelligent ways that actually make Anne Rice's story. It makes you remember how good Anne Rice's writing actually I th- is. I think all the changes are are inarguably good. Not, yes. You don't even have to just, you, we don't even have to qualify it as for the better. It's all just, uh, they're good. They're good changes. It, it, it's, it, it brings out the stuff that's already in the text about loneliness and desire and all that it's stuff. It's how she would have wrote it if she were writing it right now. If she that's had exactly to, how if I feel. If she had to do a high definition remaster of her own book right now. This yes. is a, probably how she. I read all those books. Did you read all those books, Gita? I've read Interview. I haven't read all the rest of them. Oh, okay. There, there's, 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 there's some kind diminishing of, returns, is what I've oh, heard. Oh, it's like the. <laughs> I mean, it is. It is some wild diminishing returns. I have yeah. heard there's some value in reading bad books. Listen, she, he went to Atlantis right. and then he she died. <laughs> That's where the, the story leaves off. Uh, but man, I love that show, man. It's so I good. I love that show. I uh, but I but I hate AMC Plus. Yes. Uh, I feel so stupid for having that app. It's like, can't I just torrent the show at a higher resolution? Why is it look does it look bad for you? So I subscribed to AMC Plus through my Amazon Prime, and Amazon Prime I think has just better video streaming. Oh, it looks better. Oh man. It looks okay. a lot better. I got their stupid standalone app, and I, I have yeah. Amazon Prime, and I feel like – so I only got a trial, and then I watched every available episode on the trial and yeah. then canceled it. Maybe I'll, I, I'll go back and get the Prime channel. I didn't know that was an option. I don't know how any of those things work. We have a fucking Amazon television, so I that's how I just sign up for new uh, streaming okay. services is I do it through Amazon Prime because it's easier. That <laughs> AMC know. Plus uh, streaming app is so sad. They don't even have – they don't even have Breaking Bad. They don't even oh. have. They don't even have the Walking. They have. They have like the most re- recent uh, season of The Walking Dead because Netflix has all the other seasons. Breaking Bad has, uh, or Netflix has Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, and uh, like they they don't even have most of their own shows on it. Uh, but that interview with the vampire is uh, definitely in the. It is in the weight class, in my opinion. Yes. Of your. Uh, of your Breaking Bads and your, I mean, I don't like Breaking Bad, but I love Mad Men. It reminds me of the, the apparently, so the Roland Jones, the showrunner, apparently he hired mostly playwrights. And to me, oh, that is yeah. the quality that gives it, it gives it a Mad Men-esque quality. The dialogue is so crisp. Oh my God. And I love the setting. I love, I love where the, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but mm. the interview is occurring in an interesting place. Yes. And then the actual story is set in a a fascinating geographical location. So. Yes, and it's really incredible time period that is excellent under historical explored. period. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I love it. I love uh, it. We could just talk about this for the rest I'm of the I'm always episode. saying I want there to be more. Uh, I just I only like watching, right? Not only. I, I, I like watching period television shows, right? Mm-hmm. And when you say you like period television shows, people assume you're talking about Downton Abbey or, uh, you know, the Bridgerton. Uh, uh, Bridgerton. <laughs> I, I like Bridgerton, dude. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into Bridgerton here. Uh, Brid- my, my girlfriend hates Bridgerton, uh, she just thinks it's boring, but I, I love it. Uh, I don't understand why you wouldn't want to chill with that show. Uh, people think you mean like Downton Abbey, Bridgerton, The Gilded Age, you know, mm-hmm. that's that HBO show by the Downton Abbey guy, which is also very boring. People think you mean stuff like that. But man, you can do stuff like Interview with the Vampire. Yeah. And, and you can do period TV like that, man. Try it out, yeah. everybody. Yep. Uh, you don't have to do a Star Wars origin story of an origin story or whatever. You can you can do stuff like this. Yep. It's so, so delicious. Of a it's, show. It's just real drama with a capital D. Every yeah. episode. Every episode, something life-altering will occur in yeah. the narrative. It, it just feels like this is 
capital T television. This does remind me of Sopranos, Mad Men, peak TV era TV. That, that first episode is so miraculous. Good it's miraculous. That the, that the very first thing you see is a master class advertisement for the journalist oh, who is God. doing the interview with the vampire. And I saw that right before, right after I lost my job, and I just felt a deep well of despair open up within me. <laughs> oh my god! It's uh, and then I mean, even you know the interviewer's character is is also very interesting. Dude, played by Eric Bogosian. <laughs> oh, love so him. Good, love that guy him. who everybody thinks looks like Anthony Bourdain, yeah, uh, but he yeah. doesn't really. Uh, Not yeah, really. I don't no. know. Yeah. I, I have. I everybody says that guy looks like Anthony Bourdain whenever he shows up in something. It's like uh, that's weird. No, he doesn't. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it's like, man, ah, that show's so good. It's uh, it's it's maybe the did Severance come out this year? I'm I trying think to think so. what's the show of the yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's. I mean, yeah, to me, it's it's a toss up between Severance and Interview at this yeah, point. It's, yeah, it's uh, Severance is so good. I actually just uh, just met uh, uh, Zach Cherry from the show Severance the other day. Oh, great! He seems and, like a lovely I told, guy. I told him he's that's the only show that's better than Succession. Uh, and then I said, but maybe Interview with the Vampire is better than Succession. I'm like, you know what? Actually, I think it is. And then we <laughs> talked about an Interview with the Vampire. So that was You fun. know, Interview with like, a Vampire is a lot like if uh, the characters with the worst qualities, whoever you think those are in Succession, were also vampires. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Oh, my God. I just... Yeah. Uh, I, so I, I actually listed Interview with the Vampire as my recommendation on this show a few weeks back. Uh, I, you know, so it's fun that Gita Jackson's coming in here and get to double doing the dip same a thing. little bit. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, so I get to reiterate because I received no shortage of questions from people asking, "Was that a real recommendation, or were you just joking?" It's like, please, come, come on. on. I'm not, I'm not some cosmic chess master of of ironic jokes I'll here. I'll go so as far as to recommend the '94 movie with Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt too, because oh, it's so, literature. I love Interview. that movie. With a vampire is literature. It is. And it's not stupid girl stuff. It is incredibly good American literature, meditations on death and eternity. The, sh the show is so good. Someone was like, you're you're a straight man. Uh, how Do you really like this show that's, that, that's so gay? I was like, man, yeah, dude. It, <laughs> it, it just rules. Like, if you if you can't chill with that, uh, yeah. I don't know, man. It's... Uh, it is. It is just uh, indisputably uh, uh, chill withable, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Ah, it's so good. It's just. It's finally a like a a, a new legendary TV show. Is how I feel about it. So we it don't does... get so many of those. Yeah. I watched that, that House of the Dragon. Did you watch that? It it was fine. You know, I I like drama with a capital D, and it definitely was serving. You know, serving cunt. You know, like giving us drama. I love yeah. all the scenes with like uh Allison's shitty kids. Those are my yeah, favorites. Like, I I liked that show. It's just interview with the vampires like it's a, something a, else. It's it's the next level. Yeah. I think. It's it's the to me it is the fully realized potential of what television storytelling can be. And uh so if I have to give a recommendation on the show, I would say maybe check out Mad Men, which is also on AMC Plus. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, if you haven't seen Mad Men, I've recommended Mad Men to so many people over the years and I don't think any of them have ever watched it except my one friend who binged the whole thing in like 3 days. It's I tried watching it too. Oh yeah, I gave it a shot. Mm -hmm. I watched that show after you recommended it. Oh well, I mean, you know, you didn't write me a book report, so <laughs> no, I did not write <laughs> a book report. Hey, I, not that I asked for one. The key is to approach that show as if Pete Campbell is the main character. It is a comedy. Mm. Oh, That's God, my favorite Pete. way to watch Mad Men. Don Draper, dude. Dude, he just Pete Campbell had both his parents die in separate shark attacks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So fucking funny. Yeah. There's 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 good stuff in that show, that. man. God, that's so good. It's it's a very <laughs> it is a show that does goof em ups. It's a show that does japes. The whole thing where they have the the lawn mower and it goes over that guy's toes. <laughs> it is just a it is it is a, a like a hyper defamiliarized sitcom at times, yes. which is fun. Oh god. Yes. There's some stuff going on in that show. I don't know. I, I, Brandon, I, Frank, you got anything to recommend? Uh, I don't know. Mad Men's probably pretty good. It is pretty good. <laughs> Check it out, Frank. Check I watched it the out. first season when it was kind of contemporary, like it wasn't done yet. And you watched it in 1960? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I watched it in real time because I worked at, at that ad firm. Yeah. Uh, so I was there. Oh, yeah. They, they, they probably love it over there. I, I thought it was fine at the time, but um, I was a different person then. I feel like I'd like it now.
So I'm going to recommend it blind. Go watch Mad Men. Yeah, yeah, check it out if you get a chance, Frank. Just what? It's a shame that it's not 4K on any of the streaming things. Why is Breaking Bad in 4K and uh, Mad Men's not? Such a such a shame because it is a beautiful looking show. More like Sad Men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sad about that. Do I have any TV to recommend? Well, everyone that recommended Lower Decks to me, um, saying that it Uh-oh. would it would be the uh, the the Star Trek thing that I had been missing was actually correct. Um, I like hey. it. Um, oh, but, yeah, I, th- I think that show's all right. I but, watched that but show. Something silly that happened is uh, I, w- I was watching like some interview with the uh, with the creator. Vampire. Oh, and uh, yeah, with a vampire. Um, and he was like. R- what we've made here is a show that I think could be many people's first entry into Star Trek, and like it'll it'll broaden broaden the appeal of Star Trek. It's not just for tr- for Trek fans. And then like every episode, there's they they literally list things that happened in episodes of the Next Generation or Deep Space Nine or something yeah. or the or- original series. They it's like nonstop reference stream. And it's like, you really think that this was the thing that was going to open up Star Trek to other people. It's um, whatever. I, th- that's, that's, it's not a problem. It's just very funny that this guy was like, I've made something accessible. And then it's like, here's, here's a thing where I'm going to ask if Khan or this obscure character from Star Trek, the next generation is, uh, is would win in a fight. And like, that's going to be a plot point in this and it's like okay yeah cool it's it's accessible anyway um I'll, i will also recommend uh, i haven't re- recommended any extreme music in a while and i feel like not enough people know about the band morbid saint i think they're from like wisconsin or something and they they made two albums in the 80s one of which only came out in 2015 recently and it's just like this really really smashy thrashy deathy stuff that um Sick. is it's it's very filth filled and uh i enjoyed it so check out morbid saint hell yeah I'm checking that shit out right now. Thank you. You, you yeah, think of 2015 as, uh, as recent? That's I- interesting. Uh, it's certainly recent compared to 1986 or whenever it was finished. Well, no, no. Uh, I mean, okay, it makes sense that uh, you've lived in the same place, generally the same city since 2015. Yeah. So I feel like for somebody like me who's uh, – I've had too much stuff happen in the last uh, – <laughs> in, the, in the, the years between 2015 and now. I wish there were less of it, Jerry. Yeah, I did. I did move once in the last uh, fifteen years, but it was to uh, to two miles away. <laughs> yeah. So that's about the distance that uh, I personally can tolerate. Yes. I'm putting all my stuff in a storage unit next week because I got too much stuff in my house. I'm supposed to go down to. I was building shelves uh, until I got this repetitive stress injury. Um, I got them uh, yeah. mostly up here. I'm gonna put all my video games on the wall. I'll, I'll send y'all oh, a picture. Interestingly, all my video games are in one of these Target brand uh, yeah. plastic tubs, and it's going into a storage unit. We got a different scenario. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, yeah, I've just got all the video games that you have, uh, but they fit into something the size of a pinky finger now. Yeah, on the old Misty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> all those angels dancing on the head of a pin. Play Mister for me. Is that, yeah. is that what you say oh, yeah. when when you uh, when you when you when you fire it up? Play Mister for me. There's something like that. God, a Mister is real good. Well, I have some recommendations. Get a Mister. Uh, that that's not one of mine, but you might as well take it. Uh, here are my recommendations. I would like to recommend that if you're listening to this show in some format where you can subscribe to or review podcasts, that you do that for us to keep the algorithms in our favor. In fact. We recently had to refresh our iTunes feed for complicated reasons, which means we're in more need of new iTunes reviews and ratings than ever before. Yeah, because we lost all of them. We have. I would also now. also yeah. like to recommend that listeners do not uh, email or message or Discord message me about stuff like the iTunes feed messing up. This ain't my show. I just hang out. Oh, yeah. Just just say it on the forums. As much as Tim says, hello and welcome back to my show, it ain't his show. Go to forums.insertcredit.com to talk about that and any other stuff you want to talk about. There's a great yeah. community there. Yeah. You can also go to patreon.com slash insert credit where you could become a patron to submit your own topics, listen to monthly bonus episodes and get other exclusive content. Uh, you could look for us on YouTube or I believe there's a TikTok that's going to happen at pretty, some point. Pretty soon. Pretty soon. Pretty oh. soon. Uh, this show is edited by Esper Quinn with original music by Kurt Feldman. I'm Alex Chappie. I'm Frank Cifaldi. I'm Tim Rogers. I'm Brandon Sheffield. I'm Gita Jackson. And toss your Barbies in the Garbies.
Oh, hey, uh, it's Alex Jaffe here. If you're wondering why we didn't talk about Yuji Naka getting arrested for insider trading, that literally happened three hours after we finished recording. I'll bring it up next time. Thanks. Thank you.